Howdy folks, Craig Levati here with the Houston Museum of Natural Science and the Beyond Bones podcast. This is a very special episode. We're talking to Sam Stubbs, the trilobite daddy of the Morian Hall of Paleontology. He donated most of the trilobites we have on display. This is a very immersive and imaginative conversation about deep time trilobites and, well, just everything you could think of. Hey folks, Craig Lovati here with the Houston Museum of Natural Science. This is, of course, the Beyond Bones podcast, and I am joined by, as always, my amazing and talented, more smarter than me co-host, Cat Havens. Cat, how you doing? I'm doing really good. How are you doing, Craig? I am really good. Uh, I got my lights fixed here in the old uh, kitchen studio, so now it's brighter. I and, see that. It makes your your face look brighter yeah, too. Yeah, and uh, I started. Uh, I, I got I got trimmed up yesterday uh official barber of B the beyond bones podcast mm. is tradesman barber uh, in montrose uh shout out to julio and the gang over there uh really great folks and if you walk in there a lot of the stuff on the walls i've donated to them so if you look at all like the weird art and stuff it's some of the stuff that used to be here but i gave okay. it to julio at tradesman barber speaking of having amazing uh well an amazing collection of things <laughs> our guest today is it's a guest i've wanted for a long time and uh happy accident a few weeks ago when i was at cambrian coffee i walked in with my little old dog on one arm and all of a sudden i was accosted by sam stubbs the trilobite guy sam, sam how you doing oh i'm doing great oh uh, craig <laughs> it was nice running into you at cambrian coffee it really was. I know we had, we had emailed each other back and forth a long time ago, I think when I first started. And then I went over to Cambrian Coffee because I knew we were going to you know, have them on the show. And I knew that there was you know, a whole a fun thing. And I walked in and all of a sudden, like I said, Sam Stubbs, of all people, is sitting there talking to me. And it was like, boom, boom, we're doing this, we're doing that. And you were there with John. And so yeah. it's just like all these things were happening at once. And so I'm very glad that we were able to get you on the show uh, thanks for coming in, Sam. Uh, this sure. is just, it's really fun. If you guys don't know anything about Sam Stubbs, you should know, and you're going to know today. Sam is the guy, well, Sam donated most of the trilobites that we have inside the Paleo Hall at the museum. Sam is a trilobite obsessive. Sam, I can't, I don't even know how we to. We have to give him a name, Craig. He's the trilobite daddy. We can't call him that. Let trilobite daddy. Trilobite King, the Trilobite, Trilobite King. <laughs> Sam, uh, like I said, if you if you walk into the Paleo Hall and you make that left, most of those trilobites are, are yours, right, Sam? Right. They're they're almost all mine. There are the exceptions belong to a guy named Fred Westman, and Fred was my mentor in the collection of trilobites. He was, an old, uh, he was an old oil man that lived on most continents. And whenever he showed up on a new continent, he found where the trilobites were uh, mined and went and dug up trilobites. Fred had a collection that was um, uh, approximately a little over 900 of the thousand known species at the time wow. he, uh, he, he and I met. Uh, and of course, now they're 25,000 known species. And, uh, and, and see, Fred was um, ahead of any museum in, in, the, in, the, in the, probably in the world uh, on species. But I didn't care about species because I thought that was a, a, a no-win situation. If you tried to buy every one of the species, Fred had started, by, had been buying them and digging them for decades by the time I met him. Um, and, uh, so, uh, he saw me at Houston rock and mineral, uh, shows, and he saw me picking out the top quality trilobites from the two dealers out of about 200 that had trilobites at, at a gym and mineral show mm -hmm. that came to Houston. Um, and he said, son, if you're interested in trilobites, you're going to have to go to Tucson. You know, and mm -hmm. he had a he had a a, a beard, wow. and, and he looked he 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 looked he he wasn't quite Bob Bacher beard, but he was <laughs> he was a uh, uh, he 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 looked like a prospector, um, and he was as knowledgeable about trilobites as anybody in the world, and he 
uh, st- started rooming with me at Tucson, taking me around, introducing me to every one of the dealers, because back in the uh, uh, na- late 1970s, early 1980s, you had to go to Tucson because there was no Internet. Uh, and mm-hmm. you and you had and the dealers all came to Tucson uh, and the dealers dealt with all of the diggers and the prep artists uh, and, and, and they they brought a whole year's worth of digging and prep to display at the world's largest gym, jewelry and mineral show in Tucson which is also the world's largest fossil uh, display, a, a, a sale uh, extravaganza. <laughs> and uh, so just knowing Fred and following him around for about 10 years, I got to know every everybody in the world that, that, that dealt in trial bites from, from the, the collect, from the digger all the way to the scholar. What's uh, what's so fascinating to me about trilobites is that, like you said, there's, you know, 25,000 known, uh, you know, species of these guys. And right. we were talking earlier uh, before the show that trilobites are sort of I'm going to use this to use this phrase very loosely, guys, say no to drugs. Trilobites are a gateway drug for a lot of a lot of things in the paleo world. It, it's sort of you get into trilobites, and as you were saying, it opens the door for ding ding deep time. It opens the door for even as you were even saying too. Trilobites are are little pieces of artwork. Uh, yeah, Craig, Craig and I have talked about this. Cat, uh, jump in here real quick yeah. because yeah, I, I was just going to mention that Craig, you're right. Like when I was probably five or six years old, my brother worked here. He's much older than me. He's like twelve or thirteen years older, I guess maybe. And he bought me a little trilobite from the gift shop, the small little gift shop we had here, and I still have that trilobite to this day. And it was so exciting, and it got me interested in all things museums at a really young age. Age, so it is a it is a gateway, a gateway fossil. Yeah, I, I, that's that's the thing is that you it takes a special person too to be really into trilobites because you know they are so small, but they're also so prevalent. And like to your point, like I have a few here, you know, not as many as Sam does, but I have, I have a few and they're just so beautiful. And they really are. If you walk through our hall, you will see just how beautiful each little creation is. And it's just this by hook and by crook of evolution. We get these right, Sam. Right. Uh, Craig and I got to chat briefly about the, uh, the trilobites being a gateway to the, to all of the sciences. Uh, and they, and they really are. And I, got an example of that that um i I try to make everybody aware of uh and it's interesting that cat would mention their artwork too because back at the end of may i did a zoom uh powerpoint on the trilobite the the art of the trilobite uh and that's available somehow some way through uh uh, the, the museum but ex- exactly where I don't remember, I don't know. <laughs> I'm not a I'm not a tech person, and I'm not. Uh, they I'm can not email that. education questions yeah, we'll at HMS, yeah. and they yeah. all can help them out. Okay, yeah, because there there's a there's a, there the the art is how I came to trilobites because I found a couple of them uh, when I was six years old. Um, and I, I found them in a, an unlikely place, which was Baton Rouge, Louisiana, uh, where I grew up. Uh, and the they don't have rocks in Louisiana, uh, at least not in Baton Rouge, uh, much less fossils. But they do bring in gravel to put in driveways. And so I, my neighbor got a, a new driveway, and I looked at the thousands of rocks and i found two trilobites in there they had somehow weathered out of of what wherever they had been probably in the midwest and made their way into a gravel pit and from the gravel pit to to where i could find them um i took them to show and tell in the second grade and the teacher was freaking out because she'd never seen uh, many fossils at all in baton rouge and um, had never seen a trilobite 
so she asked me to leave them and I did. And, uh, of course I left them because I, I said, why would anybody want to collect trial advice if they couldn't show them? I, and it was absolutely the whole idea is yeah. to leave them so that the different classes can come in and see them. Um, and, uh, uh a few days later, somebody stole them. Uh, so I never saw another trial of bite until I was, I may have seen some at the Smithsonian uh, as a Boy Scout. Uh, but other than that, I didn't see them anywhere except in books. Um, I'd seen, I knew what one was because my mother had shown me books that had trial bites in them. Uh, she was a bit eccentric, of course, um, to, to be showing somebody at five or, five or six years old. Uh, excuse me, I got to turn my phone off. Uh, I like your ringtone. It's very exciting. Is the symphony number nine? The phone yeah, call yeah. has to be really good for that ringtone to happen. <laughs> Must be somebody very important. <laughs> but it was probably a it, it robot was, call. It was somebody very important. Oh, okay. but, uh, but but that's the way it goes. I'll have to call him back. Uh, that's funny. I can't believe somebody uh, stole your trilobites. That's just heartbreaking. Yeah, well, that I mean, that's how fascinating. I mean, these things are so so captivating uh, that even a second grade crook um, <laughs> wanted uh, them real bad. Could, yeah, wa wanted them real bad, or thought they were worth something, or had a drug habit, or whatever. <laughs> uh, trilobites. But but anyway, the 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 um, act. I, I came at them as art and started buying them, and I bought them differently than Fred did. Fred bought the species, which is coming at it from the science, uh, with a Latin name and, a, and and trying to complete the collection of Reminds species. Reminds me like Pokemon cards, uh, you know, yeah, trying to collect Yeah, like Pokemon, Pokemon cards, uh, trial by cards. And <laughs> and I didn't do that. I I came after the ones that where if you looked at it, you went, oh, wow. Yeah. You know, yeah. uh, oh, what is that? You know, and they tended to be three dimensional because many trial bites, in fact, probably most trial bites are flat like mm -hmm. a smushed roach. And nobody cares about a smushed uh, crustacean or whatever they, they think of uh, when they look at a trial bite. And, uh, um, and that's because. Most trial, uh, uh, there were probably more trilobites in the Cambrian than at any other period of time. And the Cambrian's over a half a billion years old. And so when they trilobite appeared in the fossil record 521 million years ago, um, they, they, they've been there a long time. And, and when, when you're at, when you're on a, when you live on a, the, the, uh, shelf the the continental shelf of a of a of a continent that's breaking apart uh you live on that continental shelf well the uh, we're not talking about pangea we're talking about the time before pangea when the continents were together and they're breaking up and uh, the trial bite lives on this continental shelf well, it takes a couple hundred million years for that shelf to move all the way to to its next the next time it runs into a continent. Um, and and so during that couple hundred million years, it's picking up a lot of debris that's dropping down on top of it and layers are building up on top of that trial bite. And and the heavier those layers get, the more they crush that three dimensional trial bite because uh, the preservation of a fossil is uh, the, the fossil with a hard shell uh, is going to preserve it in three dimensions, but the, the travel time yeah. uh, is so great over these vast periods of time. I know uh, Craig is a particular uh, fanatic about scale, um, <laughs> and and the, the the deep time is a concept that you have to get your head around in order to really care about trial Um and uh, for that matter, any fossil. Uh, but you, you're, you're, um, what, what happens to the Cambrian trilobites is they get all this, this weight on them, and the rock itself crushes. And when the rock itself crushes thinner and thinner, uh, it goes from one layer uh, that, that might be several meters thick to uh, a one meter thick, and then it goes down to, you know, uh, uh, a, qu a quarter of a meter. So and there's you a got compression, 
can so it gets real happens. flat over yeah. time. All you got is a, is a, is a flat bug, and you'll see yeah. some at the Houston Museum that are flat. Not very many because I, what I collected were three dimensional. Um, what, but uh, some of the things that I collected, um, uh, uh, and, and it was almost all of the museum specimens came from me. But the but on every wall you will see at least one that came from Fred, my mentor. That's because he gave 52 specimens to the museum uh, in, in the year before he passed away. And and I helped him with that. I'm a lawyer and I helped him with the setting up how he would make that contribution and take a tax write off and other other such things. And and he he uh, uh, he let them pick the 52 specimens that they wanted. Unfortunately, they didn't have the expertise to pick what they should have picked from his collection. <laughs> <laughs> they should have asked you, Sam. They should have asked me. Uh, 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 but, but in any event, um, uh, you, th there is one trilobite that you will find over when we have the 10 families, there's a, there's a, there's a panel that has 10 families. And one of them has a, a particular species called the Cordania westmanii. Well, that was named after Fred. Oh, wow. And I insisted that you will have a Cordania westmanii for the representation of the, the family that, 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 it, that it is in. Um, sure. um, but again, that's the science. And you don't get to the science I didn't get to the science until many years after I got into the art. Uh, uh, so I start building at Fred's recommendation. He says, the way you're buying these things, I'm going to go find for you the ones that are most displayable. I'll help you. And, uh, 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 and he had plenty of displayable trial bikes uh, because yeah. he, he knew every dealer in the world. So you uh, like the ones that are like twisting and turning and bending themselves backwards and, all of it, uh, not necessarily bending them backwards because that's often a that's often a, a, a distortion, just a death a death reflex. Um, uh, I, I like the ones that get covered up uh, when when there's volcanic activity, uh, uh, huge okay. waves, yeah. tsunamis sweep mm -hmm. across large um, lar large parts of the continental shelf burying millions quickly. of trilobites quickly yeah. and either they roll up and and form this perfect ball like a if they bug. have that capacity not all of them are, can roll can enroll and not all of them can enroll perfectly and tightly and not all of them have a mechanism for grabbing hold of that enrollment but some of them do uh and that that wave comes across and buries three-dimensional trilobites and then there's a question of what happened. And then some of them twist and turn and try to get away and uh, and end up looking um, uh, look in all sorts of positions. Uh, but for the mo but for the most part, the ones I'm looking for look like they're crawling across the ocean floor. OK, and so I, animated yeah. and alive. Yeah. Yeah. But like not, not, not all trilobites crawled across the ocean floor. Some, some of them swam. Swam across. Well, some of them swam uh, in the in the. Uh, the, the seas, but they some of them swam at the top of the sea, and their yeah, eyes develop that. along the bottom. And there's one we've got. One of our specimens is is an example of that. Uh oh, <laughs> I didn't get that. That's uh, is it trilobite business, Sam? Yeah. No, it's my father-in-law trying to call me to tent to wish me a happy birthday. I happy forgot. birthday! Yeah, it's Sam's birthday yeah. today. We totally Frank, can forgot you sing that. to him after at the end, please. We, I, yeah, yeah. Off, <laughs> off the record. Off the record, we'll sing. Oh come on! <laughs> hey, so I have some people want to know questions for you, Sam. Uh, not necessarily yeah. science related, but definitely trilobite related. All yeah. I could think about was like, who dusts all those trilobites? They all have these tiny little spines and like, where do you keep them all in their, your home? I have some answers just looking at your wall, but like, wh what is it like? How many do you have in your personal space? Uh, well, I, I have uh, hundreds of them, but I, I don't know exactly. I, I don't, I've never counted them. Uh, and I've given away a bunch, as you know, that are at the museum. Uh, but I keep... I used to, uh, I buy these things that 
that it's not exactly Tupperware, uh, but Rubbermaid containers that, that they used to sell. They don't sell them anymore that are clear on the bottom and clear on the top. So you can see so what you, you got inside. So you can see what's in there without having to open the top. Um, and and I put I put in there the trilobite and I use a fixative to, uh, or a clay to, to it glue place. them down to the bottom. And I put in a label that tells me where it was found and, and how old it is and what what period it's from and it's it's scientific name. Yeah, they're yeah, really fragile hard. too, right? They and are then very I, fragile. So oh, they're incredibly fragile, yeah. and you and uh, that you have and so you you put them in these very hard containers, the hard plastic containers, um, and you stack them, and they they stack, and and you know above my my uh, washing machines and the <laughs> in the uh, laundry room and in closets and uh, things like that. I just have stacks and stacks. Wherever you can stuff. fit them. Yeah. Yeah. And Wherever I, my wife allows me to keep to put things. Back, she, I was going to say, uh, you yeah. must have a very kind hearted, patient wife. Very un, un, unbelievably uh, kind and patient and, you know, on a good day. Yeah. We were, <laughs> but you we, do have other stuff behind you, too. So you are quite the collector. I can see that's pretty cool. Well, uh, I do have a defective gene. It's a collector's <laughs> gene. Um, and it's an I, adaptive trait. Uh, yeah, it does not skip a generation. My mother had it. My grandfather had it. Uh, I think it goes back quite a ways in my family. My my children actually have it, but they deny it. And they, yeah. they you know, they've all had therapy trying to get rid of it. And, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, it, it's a it, it's something where you, you you're not. You not only want to collect it, but you want to catalog catalog it, and you want to you you want it properly identified, and you want it displayed. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that it, it's uh, people like me that have serious collector's disease usually end up junking up their homes and becoming hoarders. Uh, but. I learned a long time ago that that wasn't going to be acceptable to my wife. And therefore I've, I have spent my whole life collecting things that can go straight into a museum. There you go. Uh, 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 and that, in other words, if you don't waste your money on thousands of things that are out there that you could collect, you would collect everything. If you have, right. my, uh, if you have my gene, uh, I have a hypothesis, Sam, that I actually yeah. wrote about on collecting that it is like a ancient, uh, you know, kind of gene that was good. That was adaptive that people who collected and hoarded, you know, food or other items survived during tough times. And then that kind of gets less adaptive as we, we have less need for that sort of behavior. <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. In fact, in fact, this generation that's coming along right now hates stuff uh, they hate old furniture. They hate brown furniture. They, you know, they hate English antiques. They hate, they hate, they, they, they don't want to live in big mansions with, with rooms and, and they don't want to fill the walls with, uh, uh with they're minimalists. They, 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 they want to live in a, in a one room, uh, condominium, uh, but they usually spread out and end up in in a in a three floor one room kind of many uh, <laughs> uh so i think they, i'm i'm the same way too because i know through my life i've gone through baseball card collecting in the beginning obviously born in 83 you know baseball cards to record collecting to tattoo collecting yeah. to like all these <laughs> now different things. permanent collection. And now it's funny over the past year or so through COVID I've gone back to collecting comic books now back through <sighs> baseball You're cycling back lately. through. Yeah. And so it is one of those, it's, um, it's therapeutic obviously because it gives you something that you can like look forward to like, you know, what's coming in the mail today. And I'm sure Sam's the same way. And but I think there is something unique about when you collect things because your collection will teach generations. Yeah. And my collection of uh, comic books probably won't. You Might know, fund your retirement, Craig. <laughs> maybe, you know, or baseball cards. But it's it's one of those <laughs> things where there's something there's something about what you're collecting, though, Sam, is that it's teaching people, you know, for generations. And when all three of us on this podcast are gone, 
there's still going to be kids looking at your trilobites and that's the magic of your collection. And I want to add to that, Sam, too, just to yeah. let you know how important it is, you know, what you've done for the museum. Uh, I write the curriculum for our Ramco program that all the fifth graders in Galena Park participate in. And our introductory little grab their attention activity portion in film is all about your trilobites and all about their adaptations and the ones with little stocks for eyes and the ones with the multi lenses, you know, the different adaptations, the different kinds, and they absolutely love it. So it, it is like you, Craig said, a gateway drug. And like you said, you know, it's just, it's a great educational opportunity. So, well, I, I want, thank you, Kat for, and, uh, and Craig for the kind words, the, the, um, but uh, going, going where Craig started with his baseball cards, I did too, Craig. Don't don't get me wrong. <laughs> you know, you when when you got collector's disease, you, your your temptation is to collect everything. And so yeah. I had b uh, baseball cards, comic books, coins, stamps, teeth, uh, pharmaceuticals. Uh, uh, <laughs> I I I, I, I literally butterflies, uh, beetles, yeah, you know, ev literally everything. Matroska dolls, uh, 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 you know, you, you know, sports memorabilia, uh, I, crazy stuff. It gets expensive you know? too. I and it, and it, yeah, your parents get, <laughs> your parents decide that you will cut certain collections off pretty early on. Uh, my parents uh, but, were but, weird. My, my dad, I, I'm, I don't have a problem saying this. My dad is a hoarder. So I think yeah. when he saw me, like, all of a sudden accumulating boxes and boxes of baseball cards. I think part of him was like, he kind of like probably shed a tear and he was like, that's my boy. Because it was <laughs> like, but I will say it's gotten to the point where like I'll go on eBay and just start like, I'll be obsessed with something. And next thing I know, my mailbox is full of cards again or comic books or right. um, what was I going through another phase where I lately what I collect is, uh, this is going to sound really weird and this is a good jump off point for another show we're going to do, but I love to go visit cemeteries and take pictures of celebrities graves. So I don't yeah. think that's weird. So I think that's like, there's cool. nothing weird. There's nothing weird about that. <laughs> you know, so that. But I think we all go through, and I think especially over the last year of COVID, a lot of people are, um, since, you know, time has sort of slowed down for us. A lot of people are re-engaging with their collections that they had before. You're having more people, you know, especially the comic shops that I visit, they're coming back into the comic shops because they sometimes it's sometimes people are motivated by money, which is one thing, you know, you want to try to resell something, but it takes a special collector that's not motivated by money and just motivated by the love of the hunt. Right. You know, and if you're that way as well, I know that much that for you, it's about finding a, a new and unique species that you've never seen before. Right. Uh, right. That's why I've always been so engaged with the trilobite section at the museum is because there's so many different little jumping off points. And we were talking about this earlier, that it is a window into the history of our planet. Uh, and you see different adaptations come and go. And then mm -hmm. you said earlier, there's 25,000 known varieties of these guys. That's that's unfathomable to a lot of us just sitting right. Here. Right. Uh, and, and, and it and it's daunting if you if you're going to collect, because then, you know, well, how do you go about acquiring, you know, that number? And you get you got to get your head around that. You can't do that. Mm -hmm. uh, so and then and no museum can do that and no museum can do it no. and then have space to show to it. show it all. Uh, yeah. Right. So you 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 got to you got to move to the art and you got you got to come up with the ones that are representative of the yeah. story that you're going to tell. Because if you go down that, our, our section of trilobites, uh, our wing of trilobites, there's story after story told about evolution and about plate tectonics uh, and about enrollment uh, mm -hmm. and about naming of scientific species. And there are all sorts of stories that are told um, by the examples that the that the museum and I collaborated on the, to specifically tell those stories. Uh, you, you you the 
there isn't a kid that you can run through that section that doesn't come away with more questions than than, than they came in with. And that, that's the idea. That's the thing yeah. I've 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 been toying with this idea with the museum is that we the museum itself we have done our job. If when you walk out the door, you have more questions than you had before. Mm-hmm. I don't yeah. think anybody should walk into the museum. You know, you're supposed to say you spend eight hours there. Say you read every single label, you do everything you're supposed to do. When you walk out, you shouldn't go, okay, cool. I know everything now. You should be going, (laughs) what next? What what don't I know? That's the thing about the museum is that you walk in, you you should, you should be leaving with more questions than you ever had. It's supposed to spark an interest and set the fire. Yeah. Learning. to To his point about the trailer bites too, like you look at one representative you know say it's in a in one of the cases over there there's so many different stories and tributaries and even evolution has to take so many different pathways to even get to the point where you have you know the cute trilobite you know with the devil horns or you know with yeah. the three eyes yeah. you have to get to yeah. that point and it's not so simple and time scales and evolution is such a it's a daunting thing, for, especially for us as a species that have only been around as we know it now, what thirty thousand years. You know, uh, well, no, we 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 uh, for fifty. The most of the people on the Earth um, came out of Af- uh, Africa fifty thousand years. Yeah, yeah, somewhere between between fifty and and that that populated the Earth. Now, the species itself is somewhere between two hundred and three hundred thousand years old. Uh, but like even years that's old. nothing compared to what the time scales you're dealing with. No, they, exactly. It's a blink of an eye compared. It's to not the even a bites. second on the on the time clock yeah. at the yeah, end. The, uh, tri- trial bites had to run cl- uh, 280 million years uh, in 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 five separate major uh, time uh, um, epics. Yeah. Uh, so you're you know there you you have to get your head around. Um, the scale of deep time and and if anybody wants to get their head around the scale of deep time they need to read this book right here Hold uh, up. That, that, yeah i don't know can you see that there you go there uh, you go oh my gosh it um, looks thick i need that okay oh well and those are my markups <laughs> uh, oh my god i i'm, I'm uh these i i use tabs uh, now these i i I go through if if a book is really important, I read it three times. Could you and then I mean put different tabs at different places for the different tabs, especially I am ordering that yeah. book right now. Okay, <laughs> uh, it, it uh, Jeffrey West wrote it, and he's uh, the he's a uh, PhD from I think Cambridge. Um, uh, uh, I, I, I'm not sure where he, where he got it, but he's he's our He's the past head of the Los Alamos Nuclear Laboratories. Oh, cool. uh, the, he's the he was the top physicist in the in the nuclear physics game during the last half of the of the twentieth century. Um, he is he sent he has since gone to the uh, Santa Fe Institute, which is a giant think tank with a hundred million dollar endowment that that takes scientists in and they study different things. And he has tried. He has. He was shocked when the genome got um, mapped. Uh, mapped. Yeah, when the, when the, when they sequenced the genome yeah. in, in approximately two thousand to two thousand three, they they um, he took a look at the twentieth century as having been the century of physics because it was Einstein early in the century published his papers. Everybody stood on his shoulders and they're still standing there. Now, uh, the physics was a, is the is the epitome of the rigid science. Uh, it's mathematics. It's pure mathematics. And it and you and it's in its beauty. It's the beauty of mathematics. Um, but it it's what tells us everything at the atomic level and the subatomic level, as well as the universe level <laughs> which relates <laughs> to time the, to it, deep time it, and you talk if you want to talk deep time you talk to the physicists okay now so he takes his physics and he says wait a minute we've cracked the human genome um what is the 21st century going to look like is it going to be physics 
And he says, nope, it's going to belong to the biochemist. Uh, and and the the biochemist um, or the geneticist, uh, the the people that are digging deep inside the genome, and they they go they go to the nucleus and they find DNA material that if you stretch stretch it out, it's six feet long, and it's a long sequence, and you ch- and you and it's got three billion in, uh, 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 it, um, Pieces of information, pieces, of, uh, uh, separate bits of information, some more useful than others uh, and some that's been there a long time. And it's some come from some species and some come from other species. But there's an infinite thing to study once you right. once you once you get into that. And he says, what I need as a physicist is some mathematics. What I need is some scale. Uh, what I need is to is to, I'm going to go talk to the top people that are the top geneticists and the top geo geochemists um, and, and the top, the, the top biochemists. And I'm going to try to get, give, get, find out from them what laws they follow. We follow laws from Newton. We physicists follow laws from Newton and Einstein. Uh, and they're, 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 they're these fixed rigid laws that we can duplicate our results. Every time we run an experiment, we can run it again and get the same results. That's I want to know yeah. about, I, yeah, I want to know if biochemistry can do that. And he basically gets the top biochemists in the world, and they they can't do that. They, medicine doesn't do that. Medicine doesn't <laughs> reproduce. Or it doesn't reproduce very well. Uh, it it can it 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 doesn't have logs. It doesn't it doesn't have an Einstein. Uh, it it and so it doesn't even understand the. It's it's known for such a short period of time that there even was a genome hiding in that nucleus. So it's uh, a baby, it, it, baby. It's a it, yeah. Science yeah. We, and we comparison. have we have eighty nine trillion cells in our bodies that have these nuclei. You know, okay, and we got another I don't know probably eighty trillion that don't have the nuclei. Red that, blood cells. That, 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 like blood cells, for example, and like symbiotic bacteria and other things that live off, that, that live in our bodies that, uh, that, 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 that evolve with us. Sure. That we have to have to, that are part of us but they don't have that little code up in there. They got their own little code. The, um, I have to say you and Craig are, y'all would be very exciting at a cocktail party with deep time. <laughs> and like, yeah. how people it, would it, walk it, away slowly. Y'all, tic- and go. y'all tickle me because you get so passionate and like, so like, well, for me, yeah, yep. it's funny. You brought up, you know, the different, the, what the 21st century is or the 20th, 20th and the 21st century are going to leave behind. Cause I was listening to something recently and it's another subject that I'm really obsessed with is the uh, the concept of the Anthropocene, where right now humans, since I guess since 1750, we are leaving a indelible mark on the geologic mm-hmm. record. We, you know, with um, since about 1750, when the uh, Industrial Revolution started, we're currently paying the bill for that. Everything that we're belching into the sky is now in the geologic record. You know, everything, you know, all the coal, everything that we've done, um, even to the atomic bomb tests that we started in the 1940s, that's all now implanted. So in a million years, when somebody goes back and they, in, you know, when there's a Sam Stubbs in a million years that's collecting, you know, cars or something. He's gonna like, be silicone based Sam Stubbs. In something the, like that. Like two million years. We are, our mark, good or bad will be left on the geologic record of of the world well just like every yeah. volcanic eruption and meteor that hit yeah. the earth was before that too yeah. yep everything and gets it, recorded everything that we have been doing to the earth reflects back on us you know you that's why carbon dating works you can tell okay this happened when this exact thing happened because the 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 world is a great natural mirror to everything horrible we're doing to it uh, but that's but that's also miraculous too. When it comes back to the trilobite deal, is that these fossils were able to stick around and be viable enough for us, for Sam to collect after millions and millions of years of just chaos, you know, on the surface. And here's another thing: I know that Sam will be really 
this is probably I'm singing Sam's song right now, but um, when humans, since we haven't been here very long, when we think of you brought up earlier, you know, continental plates shifting and things like that, we think of that stuff happening in a snap of an instant. You know, the same way you know we would um, you see like a uh, I don't know what you would call it like when an earthquake happens, we think okay, boom, it's done. But some of these things were shifting for millions of years. And people can't think of that. It, it's, it's, we think of something like the Rocky Mountains took millions of years to be created. It wasn't just overnight, oh, hey, where there's the Rockies. You know, like, oh, the, the Grand Canyon took millions of years to get there. And that's a, that is daunting for a lot of people. But I think that our Paleo Hall does a good job of sort of encompassing that in just a few thousand square feet. And Sam's collection is part of the reason that it is so ingestible. Yeah. Digestible. No, it's beautifully laid digestible, out. Digestible, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's beautifully laid out. The the, the uh, uh, museum just hit a giant home run. And uh, the, the rest of the museum community around the globe took notice when we did that. Mm -hmm. um, and they're all trying to duplicate it as best they can, yeah. as fast as they can. Well, you, uh, can't we started us, with, you can't tell yeah. that story without your stuff. You can't. Yeah. It's just not. And I'm sure there's even little. Am I wrong in saying that you could have a trilobite museum as big as our museum? Like you really sure. could. If you wanted to be complete, you could sure. have four. You could have four floors of trilobites. Sure, you, you, you really easily could. But the, the, what we do is you walk into the Paleo Hall and you see five windows. And those five windows are uh, polished rock of stromatolites. They're of single-celled creatures that live in colonies that ended up stacking up or forming uh, together in what is uh, yeah, roughly you, the analogy is a coral reef. Uh, growing up from the bottom of the sea seabed. And those things run uh, from uh, a couple of billion to uh, 3.8 billion years back. You know, okay, you, you got to get your head around 3.8 billion years, single cells making a mat across the shallow sea and then uh, along comes a wave and puts a little sand over and wipes them out but then another wave but then another set of single cells covers that and they gradually uh, build up over time into these these towers or, or stromatolites these pillow shaped things that still exist off the coast of australia oh. um uh, but the 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 uh what you see are those five windows and you start studying single cell light and then it, you, you sort of get the feeling that, well, what comes next? And if you take a left, look over your shoulder, you see a sign saying Cambrian. Well, that's the Cambrian explosion of life 540 million years ago. And, that, and that's when the trilobites burst on, into the fossil record at 521. A uh, uh, million years ago, uh, 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 five hundred twenty-one. Uh, the the you go along that Cambrian wall and you get to the Ordovician, then the Silurian, the, the Ordovician wall, then the Silurian wall, then the Devonian wall, and those are your four biggies for trilobites. Mm -hmm. They go on all the way to the Permian, and if you follow, if you follow through the jawed fishes and the plants and the uh, the the amphibians and and that you eventually get to the the, the largest of the extinctions in Permian at two fifty one two hundred fifty one million years ago and you'll see a Russian trilobite there that came from my collection that is a is the in Permian because there were only three or four species still around uh, uh, at in Permian in the fossil but record huge extinction event yeah, yeah. That we have a record right. of yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, 96 percent of all species, whether in the ocean or not, uh, were wiped out at the Permian extinction. Yeah. So you it, the the how we made it, how life made it through that extinction event. I, I don't know. Life finds uh, a way. Uh, yeah. It, it the, the, the kind of stuff Craig was worried about the, you know, the atomic explosions we have and and and. Uh, 
the the uh, carbon we put into the atmosphere. It ain't nothing compared. Oh no, to what no, they, exactly. <laughs> well, in the world really will last. Nothing, we yeah. just won't. We just won't be here. Something else will take our place. Just like there you go. Everything that's, that is um, a that's the thing that I wish that more people understood that the world's going to be fine without us. You know, the oh, world right. is the, we're just, the world is, the, is going to, we're be not legit. special. The world's going to clean up after us and it's going to mm-hmm. take a while because we're doing a lot of damage not to get, you know, too far off into the weeds there, but <sighs> the world's going to be fine. We're not, we're, we're just, yeah. we're not. We might be yeah, make that, it unlivable for ourselves and then yeah. something else takes our place. Like, That's, the world is, the world is a great janitor. The world is a great uh, the the world will purify itself of yeah. us. <laughs> uh, yeah, yes, it will. But yeah. but then again, um, the w- w- what you know, who cares? Uh, <laughs> in in other words, it's um, the to 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 take issue ever so slightly with cat. Um, oh. uh, we not, no no I. Uh, we're not special, she said. You know, oh, oh okay. yes, we are. We oh, are. Yes, okay, we are. okay, we, okay. We are conscious. We are conscious of all of this stuff going sure. on around us. We've studied going back into deep time. We we understand the origins. We we at least have a yeah. rudimentary understanding of the origins of the universe, the origins of the elements, yeah. the origins of the elements. We have curiosity. Elements. We have all sorts yeah. of things. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we have. I was theories. being crass. I was being yeah. crass. Right. <laughs> well, well, no, it's understandable, and I understood the context in which yeah, you yeah. said that. I know. No, uh, but I think and, you're right. You're right. Yeah, and so you 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 know we. We 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 are so unique. We can't even find out if we're unique uh, because we can't. We're looking for exoplanets. We're hoping somebody yeah. will have this same kind of perfect uh, atmosphere and the oceans and the things that we needed for for uh, uh, carbon based life. Mm-hmm. We're, we're keeping. We hoping maybe there'll be silicon based life. And we're uh, and we're looking for some of the. If you line up the periodic table and yeah. the all of the things under carbon, you, yeah. you keep hoping that there are enough connections that can be made with some of these other elements. Uh, but the likelihood of it is, is slim based on what we know about the creation of those elements. Um, but that yes. what you need to know about the, the fact that we're special is that we get to keep this consciousness for a lifetime. And so, therefore, we get to be lifetime students of what's going on around us. And, and the reason you and I, all of us on this phone call uh, and the people who are listening, is because we understand that the museum is this fabulous tool for for taking that consciousness and and, and letting people understand that they they got a lifetime to study this mm-hmm. stuff and they got a lifetime to figure it all out. And the study during their lifetime, they're going to be breakthroughs and incredible things. You know, for, in my lifetime, it, it, it's crazy what has happened with yeah. international travel and a cracking of the genome and the computers and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The 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 uh, uh, we we have all kinds of problems that have been created by the, the billions of people that live here on the on the surface. Uh, but yet our numbers are tiny when compared with other species, <laughs> especially yeah. at the single cell level. Uh, and, and, the, and, and, and the biological weight of the, of the single cells that live beneath the surface so deep that we didn't even know they were there. And now that it turns out that there's more biological mass of those single yeah. cells that may live for thousands of years because they don't mm-hmm. use up any yeah, energy you know we we're, no metabolism we're to speak no metabolism to speak of yeah no no metabolism to speak of no movement to speak of mm-hmm. no reproduction to speak of and yet they're down there and they're alive mm-hmm. and they're more they 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 outweigh the whole biomass that's above the earth above that's pretty cool uh, wish, anywhere above the earth i wish that it's people, crazy what we're learning uh, i wish that people the were pyramid. to i wish that people were yeah. able to in to di- I use the w- right word this time digest. I yes. wish that yeah. people were right to uh, were able to digest all that information and realize just how special we all are and everything that's around us. If like if that's a one thing that I wish I could leave behind for everybody was that okay this is all really special. That's why we should treat each other with respect and with love because it's a darn miracle that we're even here. 
you know, yeah. it's a, it, it's, it's, it, it makes you really, the story Appreciate. of the, the story of the museum is more of you, when you walk out, you should be like, wow, I, it's really even a miracle. And I, when I say miracle, I don't mean so much as a biblical miracle. Cause I know some people are probably it was statistically that. unlikely. Yeah. That we're even here and it should make you just appreciate, you know, everything all the more it's, it's, yeah. If I get, well get too far of that. Yeah. If I, get I keep, I keep, that. I keep Craig's emotions in check. That's my job. <laughs> Cause I'll start crying and I'll be like, he will. He gets very emotive. And it's we love him. That, it's beautiful that we're even have rocks. And then it, I, 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 no, no, no. Yeah. yeah. I, I think, I, I think we can sum up what Craig um, just said by saying, isn't it great? We're in Houston. It's great. <laughs> and it makes you feel very lucky that we are even, I always say that I'd love to see the music. I'd love to see HMS in 100 years yeah. to see, to see yeah. like, cause if you even, if you look back at the, look back at our collection that we had in the 1900s, the, the minuscule amount of knowledge that we knew. And then if you were to go forward and show somebody the museum now, they'd be like, how do you guys know all that stuff? But then I'd also like to see the museum ahead and they would go, oh, wow, you guys only knew about 25,000 trilobites? So Craig is yeah. young, <laughs> Sam. Craig is super young. Um, I Just the museum from the 1970s, mid-70s, when I was a six-year-old, is so vastly different. And even while I worked here over the yeah. past 25 years, it is a completely different place. And if there is any kind of growth like that over the next 100, 200 years, this place is right. going to be unfathomable. Yeah, yeah, it's cra it's crazy the changes that I've seen since I've been on the board. <laughs> but yeah. that's that's why we need people, and that's why we need little Sam Stubbses out there that are listening to this show, you know, in the car with their mom and their dad. We need people to collect knowledge. We need people to collect trilobites or whatever whatever your trilobite is in your world. You need to cr collect that because that's that passed down knowledge. And I think well, it's to, the passion, it's the passion, but it's also, it's passing down generational knowledge and, and information that we need to have to build on top of each other, you know, to, to make a, make it a better world. Sam's and, the 21st century natural philosopher. There you go. The early cabinet guy. <laughs> well, I, I tell you what, um, we need, we need to do another one of these zooms and we need to, we need to do it um, about a guy named Richard Forty, okay? Um, Richard Forty was the keeper of invertebrate paleontology at the British Museum for most of his life. He's retired now, um, uh, but he's the most prolific author uh, on trilobites in, in the history of the world. Um, and he, he, he's a Cambridge PhD that teaches at Oxford. Um, and they call him the keeper of invertebrate paleontology, which is what we would be, we call a curator in, of invertebrate sure. uh, paleontology here. Um, uh, but he, he lived in the window when the British Museum, uh, the Natural History Museum is what they, is the official name of the, of the museum, but it's the British Museum. Uh, what they did, uh, they lived at a time when the the scientists could devote their whole lives to their little niche of mm -hmm. science, uh, and he and and before the sciences all started getting merged together, and before the collections became mm -hmm. too big for the museums to handle, and 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 their and the 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 life lessons that these people brought into the office every day and shared with one another when they went out for their fish and chips or they, their smoke breaks uh, that killed most of them. Uh, but the, the, uh, you, you can get, you can get this tremendous insight into science by just reading the many, many books that, that Richard Forty wrote. We had him visit in 2018 i i had him visit in 2018 and he spoke at the museum um and to a packed crowd and he signed his books um and i have pretty much every one of his books that he wrote but the um the ones that i would recommend to you to start with are, are life uh 
which I don't know if you can see that one. Yeah, I got it. Yeah. And then that one. trilobite <laughs> eyewitness to evolution. Uh, and that's where he uses his trilobite knowledge that he began at age 14 when he was amazed at seeing a, a trilobite. Um, uh, the, the, uh, he uses that, the fact that trilobites had eyes and they had compound eyes and that they were still, they were, st- they, they were still made out of calcium like the rest of the shell, mm-hmm. but they were clear where they, where they could get light through them and they could process the light into visualization for finding food and mating so and they whatever were, else they needed. They were seeing. They were seeing. They, you know, yeah. right. they were first seeing light and dark, fossil, right? First animal in the fossil record with bilateral symmetry, first with eyes, first with compound eyes, all Swim these to the things. Light. Yeah. And then, and so he he takes life, uh, which is uh, w- w- complex life, and you can't get there without trilobite. And then you got the trilobite who watches for three hundred million years, watches the evolution of life. So he follows evolution. And then, and in, in that, uh, uh, this book was ninety seven. This one was two thousand. In two thousand three, Bill Bryson He's writes on a three year this cycle. Book. Uh, called A Short History of Nearly Everything. <laughs> and in that, Bryson, a, another a brilliant Brett that writes well, uh, mm. uh, it, it, he interviews five or six of the world's most important scientists uh, and then tells, you, uh, tells a brief history of everything from the Big Bang through civilization. And the person that he interviews the most for this book is Richard Forty. So the trilobite dude, <laughs> uh, that told uh, me something. So he's quoted in here, and it's all, all sorts of things about the, the, the start of life, the evolution of life, the birth of civilization, so forth and so on. And then Forty follows it uh, <laughs> in 2004 with, uh, uh, with the book Earth. Um, and he <laughs> originally titled it uh, Earth, an unauthorized biography. <laughs> I love and, that. And that's yeah. that's how that's how it was released in Britain. It was it's called an intimate history over mm. here because uh, we're, we're I don't know politically correct or whatever, uh, or we don't have the the British sense of humor. No, that, no, that we do have. not. And I'm gonna have to uh, tear off my corkboard and get some red string and pins so I can keep <laughs> up with this conversation yeah. and the many branches. Yeah where it's going uh, it's it's evolving yeah it is evolving and that that's beautifully put cat because that the 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 um what 40 tells you is what 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 you can do with a life in science if you spend it at a place like the british museum uh and it, and if you if you write well <laughs> and if you're a good scholar and and he tells you what you need to study and in what order you need to study it in Oh, that's cool. So it's uh, sort of like a guidebook for a young scholar. Yeah. Yeah. You can't go wrong with reading the one, the three that I just held up there. You can read the, his other 10 or 12 books too, but those are the, that's the, what you really need to read to really get his feel for uh, I, life on this planet. I feel a book purchase in my future, Craig. I already bought the <laughs> the scale book while we were talking. I'm going to have to catch up. We were talking and I was like, okay, yeah. I know. I saw I saw you. I saw you. I saw what you were doing. Sam, I, was, I was carrying it for you. Sam, yeah. thank you so much. Thanks, we've spoken, Sam. We've spoken for an hour and we're going to do we're going to do this again. Yeah. Um, okay. And I'm going to read up first. <laughs> we're going to do this again. And uh, happy birthday, by the way. Yes. Oh, thank you very much. Um, um, I'm, I'm, this is one of my, sing, Craig. this is probably one of my favorite podcasts we've ever, re- which is probably one of the favorite things I've ever recorded, quite honestly. And I've been recording for a long time. And well, thank uh, you, Craig. That's, thank a, you. You're, that's a wonderful compliment. And you I appreciate it. it very much. Awesome. I've enjoyed it too. It's very interesting. I like how you can go in eight different directions. <laughs> it's I like to have to keep up with somebody. That's fun. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that, that's the way life is. You go in yep. a lot of directions all at once. Yep. Uh, a lot of windows open on your computer. This is, this is just the beginning of this, this long series of conversations, <laughs> but we've already wasted enough time. Uh, you have birthday boy stuff to do and Kat's probably yep. got a class to teach and <laughs> I have a dog to take outside. All so right. There you go. <laughs> the queen right. has to go to the bathroom, or the king it's, has Prince, to go to the bathroom. The princess has to go to the bathroom. Yeah, it's time to go. There we go. All, All right, right guys. guys. 
Thanks, well, thank Sam. You. Happy having birthday. Me. Thank you for having me. You got Thanks it. Thanks for being here. All right. Talk to you later. All right. Bye. Bye. Bye.